seated. Our sermon theme for this morning is how God demonstrates his love for us. All our lessons center around this theme of God showing his love for fallen mankind. Our first lesson shows the greatness of God's love for us. Just think about it. Jesus died while we were still his, while still sinners, ungodly and his enemies. And he did this in order that we might be reconciled to God. Our gospel lesson shows Jesus placing his compassion for those who don't know him and believe in him, believe in him on his disciples so that they would pray for the lost and also that he might send them to preach the gospel to them. And in our sermon text, we will see from the example of Israel that God has rescued us by his grace so that we can be his holy people, shining his light to the world around us in both word and example. May God bless us as we consider how God demonstrates his love for us. We will begin by singing hymn 234, Praise to the Lord the Almighty, in 234.
the order of word and sacrament. It's found on page 26 in the front of your hymnals, page 26. Please turn to that now and please stand. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. God invites us to come into his presence and worship him with humble and penitent hearts. Therefore, let us acknowledge our sinfulness and ask him to forgive us. Holy and merciful Father, I confess that I am by nature sinful and that I have disobeyed you in my thoughts, words, and actions. I have done what is evil and failed to do what is good. For this I deserve your punishment both now and in eternity. But I am truly sorry for my sins, and trusting in my Savior Jesus Christ, I pray, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, our Heavenly Father, has been merciful to us, and has given us His only Son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. Therefore, as a called servant of Christ, and by His authority, I forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. For all that we need in life, and for the wisdom to use all your gifts with gratitude and joy, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord have mercy. For the steadfast assurance that nothing can separate us from your love, and for the courage to stand firm against the assaults of Satan and every evil, hear our prayer, O Christ. Christ have mercy. For the well-being of your holy church in all the world, and for those who offer here their worship and praise, hear our prayer, O Lord. Lord have mercy. Merciful God, maker and preserver of life, Uphold us by your power, and keep us in your tender care. Amen. The works of the Lord are great and glorious. His name is worthy of praise. protector of all the faithful, you alone make strong, you alone make holy. Show us your mercy and forgive our sins day by day. Guide us through our earthly lives that we do not lose the things you have prepared for us in heaven. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. verses 6 through 11. 
It's a beautiful passage showing God's amazing love. A love that moved him to die while we were still sinners. I mean, think about it. Is there anything that I could do that would ever get you to sacrifice one of your children for me? To, that I would deserve that? We can't in any way deserve the love that God has shown us because that is what God did for us. He sacrificed His Son to save us when we were sinners and enemies of Him. He did this in great love. Love that is undeservable. Love that has made us His children. Let's read about this amazing love. You see, at just the right time, when we were still powerless, Christ died for the ungodly. Very rarely will anyone die for a righteous man, though for a good man someone might possibly dare to die. But God demonstrated His own love for us in this, while we were still sinners. Christ died for us. Since we now have been justified by His blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through Him? For if, when we were God's enemies, we were reconciled to Him through the death of His Son, how much more, having been reconciled, shall we be saved through His life? Not only is this so, but we re also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Alleluia. May your priests be clothed with righteousness. Your saints sing for joy. Alleluia. stand for the reading of the Holy Gospel. The Holy Gospel for us this morning is from Matthew chapter 9, verse 35, through chapter 10, verse 8. Jesus looked out over the nation of Israel, and he had compassion. Even though these were the very people who rejected him and didn't believe in him, he had compassion. He wanted them to know about their salvation. And so he asked his disciples to pray. And not only did he ask them to pray, but he answered their prayers by sending them out to the people, to the people of Israel, to spread the gospel. You know, God has the same compassion over all the people in Kiwani, Kiwani County, Wisconsin, the United States, the world. And he asks us to pray for them. Pray that people might go out. And you know how he answers his prayers? Not only by sending missionaries, by putting the gospel in our hearts and on our tongues, to share them with our family and friends, that they too might know the love of God that is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Let's read the gospel lesson. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. He called his twelve disciples and gave them authority to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, who was called Peter, and his brother Andrew, James the son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas, and Matthew, the tax collector, James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon the zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Do not go among the Gentiles or enter, enter any town of the Samaritans. Rather, go to the lost sheep of Israel. 
as you go preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse those who have leprosy. Drive out demons. Freely you have received. Freely give. This is the gospel of our Lord. Please be seated. We will now sing our next hymn, hymn 365, Love Divine, All Love Excelling, hymn 365. Grace, mercy, and peace are yours from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, your brothers and sisters in Christ. Our sermon text is Exodus chapter 19, verses 1 through 8. It's printed in your bulletin. Let me read it. In the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day, they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out from Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, this is what you are to say to the house of Jacob and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, if you fully obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. So Moses went back and summoned the elders 
of the people and set before them all the words that the Lord had commanded him to speak. The people all responded together, We will do everything the Lord has said. So Moses brought their answer back to the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. We bow our heads in prayer. O oh Lord Jesus, you have made us to be a kingdom of priests and your holy people. You promised this by St. Peter. You have saved us, not only from our sinfulness, but also for you. Help us do all that you command out of love for you, that we may glorify your word, you, glorify you in the world. Help us understand and see the blessings that you have poured out on us, that we may live for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Please be seated. Do you try to keep the Ten Commandments? And if so, why? Is it to try to earn favor with God that he'll bless you? Do you try to keep the Ten Commandments in order to get to heaven? Is it because you're afraid of losing your salvation? Well, on another note, what about those pet sins of yours? How do you excuse getting drunk? Do you say to yourself, well, it's not that bad of a sin, and, you know, I always make sure I'm in control. How do you excuse sexual immorality? You say to yourself, you know, we'll probably get married anyway, or it's only a picture on a screen. I can look as long as I don't touch. How do you excuse the times when you gossip about other people? You say to yourself, well, I only tell the truth. It's not like I'm lying, and God will forgive me anyway. Maybe all we need to do is just a little bit more good, maybe give a little bit more money in the offering plate, and, you know, make up for our sins a little bit. We Lutherans are in a dilemma. You see, if we're saved by grace alone, through faith, then what do we, should we do with the Ten Commandments? Does it matter if we keep them? Does it matter if, if Jesus' work alone declares me a child of God and an heir of heaven? If that's the truth, then, then what purpose does God's law have for us? Well, we're going to look and let the example of what God said to the Israelites answer that question for us this morning under the theme, You are God's holy people. You've been saved by God's remarkable love. And you've been chosen to be God's treasured representatives to the world. Our text begins, In the third month after the Israelites left Egypt, on the very day they came to the desert of Sinai. After they set out for Rephidim, they entered the desert of Sinai, and Israel camped there in the desert in front of the mountain. Fifty days had passed since Moses led the Israelites from out of Egypt, the land of slavery. The Israelites made it to the mountain which God commanded to them to go, and that mountain was Sinai. We read in our text, Then Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, This is what you are to say to the house of Jacob, and what you are to tell the people of Israel. You yourselves have seen what I did to Egypt and how I carried you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. God chose the Israelites to be his own special people. He saw their plight in Egypt. He had compassion on them. He decided not only to end their slavery, but also to make them his very own. So what did he do? The last 50 days showed the Israelites what he did. He rescued them. He brought them out of, the Re out of Egypt by dividing the Red Sea for them. And in that same sea, he swallowed up all their enemies who pursued them. The Lord God himself, himself was with them as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. He led them through high water and desert plain to himself, providing food, drink, clothing, shelter, and protection along the way. 
Like being on the wings of, the, of an eagle, they soared high above all the dangers that threatened them. And why did God save the Israelites? Was it because they were so good and lovable to the Lord? No, their history reveals anything but that. They grumbled. They complained almost the entire 50-day journey. They even went so far as saying they wished they were back under slavery, under the Egyptians. They acted worse than, than stubborn children do when parents want to take them somewhere new and they howl and complain the entire way, even though the parents know that they will like, the children will like it. The Israelites showed very little trust. And still, the Lord saved them. Why did he save them? It was because of his own grace. He loved them because he decided to love them. He chose the Israelites to be his very own people. In love, he brought them to himself. Did you know that we were also delivered from slavery? That's right. All of us were born into slavery. Not into the slavery of another nation, but into the slavery of sin. Jesus himself says, I tell you the truth, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. Since, there is, since sin was once our master, there was no way to escape that master. And we were all enemies of God because of sin. In our hearts, we wanted nothing to do with him. But God, in great love, decided to save us. And why? Was it because we're so good and so lovable? No, we're just like the Israelites. We also are prone to complain and grumble against God. There is no good in us that should move God to love us. So why did he decide to free us from our bondage to sin? The same reason he did it for the Israelites. Grace. God simply decided to love us and have pity on us. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. Jesus paid for our sins by dying for them on the cross, but he didn't stop there. He also called us to faith through the gospel in word and sacrament that we might receive his forgiveness. You see, the gospel and word and sacrament, those were really the eagle's wings, so to speak, that brought us to God's holy mountain. No, not to Mount Sinai, but to a different place, to Calvary, where God himself died for our sins. Christ's work has set us free. And if the Son sets you free, you will be free indeed. Now, did you notice that in the first few verses of our text, God does not mention any, any action on the part of the Israelites that saved them or brought them to the Lord. Why doesn't God mention any? Because there are none. It is as Paul wrote in his letter to the Ephesians, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is a gift of God, not from works, so that no one can boast. Now, why did God show us this remarkable love? Well, simply put, he showed us this remarkable love so that we could be his holy people. Now, let's see what that means, being his holy people, in the next part of our text. The Lord tells the people through Moses, Now, if you obey me fully and keep my covenant, then out of all nations you will be my treasured possession. Although the whole earth is mine, you will be for me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words you are to speak to the Israelites. The Lord saved the Israelites so that they would be his special holy people, his treasured possessions. He saved the Israelites so that they would keep his covenant. For a similar reason, God saved us. In order to understand what I mean, we'll go back to that book of Ephesians, chapter 2, verse 10, which reads, For we are God's workmanship, 
created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. God and God alone saves us from our sins. He not only saved us from something, though, he also saved us for something. And what is that something that we've been saved for? We've been saved for good works. We've been saved to be his holy people. Now let's go back to the Israelites. The Lord in love chose them to be his holy people. He did not choose them so that they could continue sinning, so that they could continue rebelling against him. But he chose them so that they would stop. He wanted the Israelites to be a light in this dark world. He wanted them to be different than the nations around them so that when other nations would see the Israelites, they would ask, why are they so different? Why don't they enjoy the sinful pleasures we enjoy? Why are they so self-controlled? Why do they rely on God so much? Why don't they worry like the rest of us? God wanted his Old Testament people to be a light in this world, proclaiming who the true God is and how he saves. In this way, they would be a nation of priests. Now the same is true for us. God did not save us in order that we could continue in our sins and our sinful way of life. No, he saved us so that we could be his holy people. He saved us from sin and for himself. And he has prepared good works for us to do. Are these good works meant to earn heaven and God's love for us? No, absolutely not. Rather, they are meant to bring glory, to glorify God on this earth. God wants us to be different. He wants people in the world to ask, why is Frank over there so faithful and loving to his wife. He never says anything bad about her. He always talks about how good she is. I wonder how they do it. How do they keep their love for each other? Look at Jill. She just lost her job and she's wearing a smile. I would be freaking out right now. How can she remain so calm? Did you hear about Bill? Rumor has it that he helped some bum off the street who after being invited in for some food, stole his wallet and laptop that were sitting on the coffee table in the living room. I can't believe that he just laughed it off. I would hunt that bum down and seriously hurt him if I ever caught him. But Bill, he prayed for him. You see what I mean? When we keep God's law, we become a light to the world around us. They see our actions and they start to ask questions. Questions of why we are the way we are, questions about our faith. And this gives us opportunity to share the gospel with others. This is why St. Peter wrote, But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation belonging to God, that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, but now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Dear friends, I urge you, as aliens and strangers in this world, to abstain from sinful desires which war against your soul. Live such good lives among the pagans that, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds and glorify God on the day he visits us. So why do we keep the Ten Commandments? Simply because Jesus saved us to keep them. His salvation means that we belong to the Lord and that we're holy in God's sight. Now, now that God has declared us holy, now that we are citizens of heaven, now that we are his representatives on this earth, we want to act that way. As we live our lives of service and good works to God, we glorify his name. People will see that we're different and God will use that to attract people to himself. It gives us opportunity to share the gospel. But we still have a sinful nature. I'm sinful. Pet sins still haunt me. 
My thoughts are not pure. My words can be filled with manipulation and gossip. I don't act in love towards God, but selfishly. What does that make me? When you start feeling this way, look to the cross. Look to the re cross and repent because it's there that God, that you see how much God loves you. Every sin of yours was placed on Jesus. He won complete forgiveness for you. And with his, cover, with his forgiveness covering you, he will also give you strength to fight against all that entices you to sin. Concerning the feelings of guilt over sin, St. John wrote this marvelous passage. I quoted it even last Sunday's sermon, and I'll quote it again. My dear children, I write this to you that you will not sin. But if anybody does sin, we have one who speaks to the Father in our defense, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. He is the atoning sacrifice for our sins, and not only for ours, but for the sins of the whole world. Why do we keep the Ten Commandments? Because in keeping them, we demonstrate to the world that we, that the full righteousness that Jesus gave to us as a gift. By keeping them, we demonstrate that we belong to the Lord and through words and actions, we call the world to repent and believe in Jesus. Dear brothers and sisters in Christ, you are God's holy people. You've been saved by his remarkable love. You've been chosen to be God's treasured representatives to this world. Amen. Now may God's peace, which is far greater than any mind can understand, guard and keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Let us now stand and confess our saving faith with the words of the Nicene Creed on page 31. The Nicene Creed on page 31. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became fully human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who in unity with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Please be seated. We will now gather our gifts for our Lord. Lord Jesus Christ, we come before you in thanksgiving for all the love that you have shown us. We thank you for going to the cross while we were still powerless, weak, and your enemies. And in love, you died for us. You sent your gospel forth to call and bring us to faith. What love you have lavished on us, an eternal love. Accept these gifts, these tokens of our thankfulness. Use them for the spread of your gospel here and throughout the world. Only, not only use these gifts, use all that we have and are, that we may proclaim your saving name. You saved us to be your holy people. people. And as your holy people, may we in all we say and do give glory to you and point people to Christ. In your name we pray. Amen. Let us now stand and pray the prayer of the church on page 32 in the front of your hymnals, page 32. Gracious God and Father, we praise you for the countless blessings which we receive from your hand, the beauties of creation, the bounties of the earth, 
the joy of life and the pleasure of friendship, the good of work and the gift of rest, the privilege to share happiness and sorrow with one another. Above all, though, we praise and thank you for your saving word and for your Son's body and blood, which you give us to eat and drink in the sacrament. Through these means of grace, you have sent the Holy Spirit into our hearts and unite us to Jesus and to the whole Christian church on earth. Strengthen us through this heavenly food. Increase our trust in Christ and our love for one another. Great God and Lord, without your continuing help, we easily waver in our faith, lose courage, and grow careless in our watchfulness. The times and days are perilous. Give us strength to face the evils of each day with fresh confidence. Open our lips to speak of your grace and move us to use the gifts that you have given us, that you give us, to share your word of salvation with all people. Protect and prosper the family, the school, the government, and all good institutions that you have established for the benefit of society. Remember in mercy those who are sick and suffering and bring healing to troubled homes and lives. Move us to pray for those in need and to help them with deeds of kindness. We come before you on behalf of all those who have birthdays this week. Eleanor Mockwood, Laverne Miller, Miller, Diane Schneider, Walter Wigley, Jordan Butchert, Paul Getch, Tricia Nimichek, Joe Nimichek, Harry Apichka, Henry Apichka, Amber Vaness, Mia, Mia Eilenfeld, Edward Jurgensen, and Louis Sigmund. We thank you for the years of grace you have blessed them with, and we ask you to bless them with many more, centered in you and your love for them. Keep their faith strong and kindled in you. And allow them to faithfully serve you throughout their lives. We also come before you on behalf of those who celebrate anniversaries. Erwin and Eileen Jasma, Lyle and Lois Sigmund, Ken and Lois Sigmund, Wenzel and Karen Robick. We thank you for the years of marriage that you have blessed them with. And we ask you to continue to bless them. Give them and grant them the forgiveness and love that you yourself have shown upon them. And may they always grow in service and love for each other. Forgive them in forgiving each other and being patient with one another. Bless them with many more years of marriage. We ask all these things in your saving name. Now to the eternal God, keep us in the saving faith and so enable us to overcome all things through our Lord Jesus Christ. And we pray all these things in your name, praying the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We will now continue with our communion liturgy on page 33. There is a special note in the bulletin for our visitors. We practice something called closed communion here. If you want to know about this practice, please read the note in the bulletin. If you want to know even more, I am more than happy to share uh, the reasons and rationale of this practice with you after the service. Um, just tap me on the shoulder and we can have a talk. If you ever want to also join us for communion here too. I can tell you how. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In love he has blessed us with every spiritual blessing. He sends the Holy Spirit to testify that we are his children, to strengthen us when we are weak. Now have come the salvation and the power and the kingdom of our God and the authority of his Christ. To him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb be praise and thanks and honor and glory forever and ever.
Our Lord Jesus Christ, on the night on which he was betrayed, took bread, and after he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Then he took the cup, gave, it to his disciples, uh, gave thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and drink. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. Do this whenever you drink of it in remembrance of me. The peace of the Lord be with you always.
please be seated. Good morning and welcome to worship this morning. A uh, couple of announcements. I'll, uh, first of all, that there's two picnics this week. The Owls is having their picnic on July 12th, Tuesday at noon. And the Ladies' Aid at July 14th on Thursday. Both are at Brummer Park. You're invited to both. So please plan on coming for some good food and fellowship. Also, it's a potluck, so if you want to bring something, a dish to pass, please feel free to do so. This uh, coming week at uh, Thursday at 6.30, I believe, it's on the calendar, uh, 6.30, we're going to have a vacation Bible school teachers meeting and just a general meeting too. We'll start off with a general meeting. So if you'd like to help out with vacation Bible school, if you volunteered to help out with vacation Bible school, please plan on coming to this meeting. We'll begin with just a little general information and then we'll go on into a teacher's meeting at 6.30 this Thursday. If you can't meet, make a meeting, talk to either Connie or myself. Also, after church, uh, we are going to be having a Bible class downstairs. Now, why would I ask you to stay longer on a very hot day in a hot church? That's why I have it in the basement. It's cooler downstairs. This is a Bible class on church and ministry. Now, that might seem like a really boring title. But church and ministry really encompasses a lot of things. It encompasses how Christ saved us. What is the church on this earth? We talk about, even touch on, like just this morning, we'll talk on predestination even. Um, coming up in topics are topics that a lot of people have questions about. Like, why are there different churches on this earth? Different visible churches. So a lot of these topics are being discussed throughout the summer. Not all on today, but throughout the summer. We're having this Bible class so we can look at God's Word and see what it says about the church and see what it says about our mission so that as we go forward, we can look and say, this is what God wants us to do. Let's go do it and all be encouraged and encouraging one another. So I highly encourage you to come downstairs for this Bible study. Don't worry, I won't be asking any questions that will, I won't be asking any questions or putting anyone on the spot. So you don't have to be worried if thinking that oh, I don't know the answers. This is for learning, and it's a wonderful Bible class. Um, as I said, today's service leads really well into this first Bible class session about what is the church, how are we God's holy people, and rejoicing in that fact. So please join me downstairs for that Bible class following the service. That's all the announcements that I have, unless anyone else... Oh, there was one more. Mark on your calendars, August 7th. August 7th, after church, is a voters meeting. Not on the calendar yet because it's a month away, but just giving you a little bit of foreknowledge. And I'll be trying to remember to, to do that every week. August 7th is a voters meeting. Voters meetings are important and we encourage everyone to come to hear about everything that's going on in this church. Because this ministry is not my ministry, it's your ministry. So, August 7th, after church, voters meeting. That's all the announcements I have. I'll see you in the back.